There will be no kiss for the bride at this wedding, nor will the couple dance after the ceremony. In fact, the newlyweds won't get anywhere near each other at all. To an outsider, it's hard to tell which of these men is the groom. But the unlikely new husband is standing a little apart from the rest. I'm 12. My wife is 15. There never kisses at weddings. It is against the law. We will start talking to each other in a month or so. Marriage is the main objective in life for a Kaldoresh. But none of them are free to choose their own partners. Children have no say in who they marry. It's the parents who arrange the weddings. More often than not, a young couple will be married just three days after they're introduced. Twelve-year-old Yasha has been a husband for a year now. His parents paid 200,000 rubles, that's almost $7,000, as a dowry for the future lady of their house. She's got such green eyes. She's beautiful and smart, and she knows how to make tea. She's hardworking, that's great. Why else would I marry her? Working is good, all the dishes should be done, and everything must be in order at home. When they found a husband for me, I didn't like him, but it made no difference because they had already made their choice. These are our customs. You learn to like him later. Three families live in this house, Yasha's parents, Yasha and his elder brother, together with their wives. Yasha's brother is 15, and he already has a child. Everyone helps to babysit. Whoever is free becomes the nanny. Daughters-in-law always do the cooking and cleaning. As soon as a girl is married, she takes on all the housework. But the mother-in-law doesn't believe that modern young ladies know how to keep a house in order properly. Take the mop and clean the floors. Come on. Come on. Why do I have to ask all day to get the dishes washed? Before her marriage, Yasha's wife Cassandra had a dream. An unusual one for a modern Romani girl. I wanted to become a nurse, but there's no way Romani girls can do that. Girls here must live by many strict rules. They cannot refuse to work. Hair cannot be brushed after lunch, and they're not allowed to cross the path of a man. Even their skirts mustn't touch a man. There are no studies and no dreams for a Calderesh girl. Men have a different fate. They have to study, but not for long. Five years at most. They only need to know how to read and write in Russian, and above all, how to count. What have they been teaching my child for five years? He is in fifth grade now, but he doesn't know anything. He cannot read at all, and he can only do just a little bit of math. I don't know what they have been teaching him. Mothers play little part in their children's education, but all of the women help to look after the camp's children. The biggest danger is posed by roads. Russians always read bedtime stories to put their children to sleep. I simply rock my baby, sing a lullaby to him, and that's it. I never read to him. I don't need books because I can't read. All of the camp's men are builders, without exception. They specialize in building summer houses and saunas. Sunday is always their busiest day, as they all make their way to nearby villages in search of work. And unlike women, Romani men are allowed to dream. I want to have a house and a beautiful car, a foreign-made car. 
The camp where Yasha lives was set up no more than two years ago. The community here is not particularly wealthy. All the money earned by the men goes towards home renovation. It's rare to spend a lot of money on children. They have few toys and play with whatever they can find. Computers are almost unheard of. Yasha first saw a laptop when he visited a neighboring camp. It's all very easy. First you have to flip it open. And then you have to switch it on. And wait for it to load. Maxim is considered the local genius. He knows all the football clubs and their players by heart. He's been watching football since he was five. Six, actually. Well, for example, who's 15 for Spain? Sergio Ramos. And Portugal, number 10? There's, there's no number 10 in Portugal's team. No? No. What about number seven for Portugal? Seven in Portugal? Yeah. Everyone knows that. Cristiano Ronaldo. And do you know Germany's goalkeeper? Emmanuel Neuer. I'll be a builder when I grow up, not a football player. Romani men can't become football players. We all become builders. There is a stereotype of how the Romani are supposed to look. It includes a colorful shirt and a skirt and a bright colored neckerchief. However, the Romani in England looked like this, because they mainly wore what people gave them. Several years ago, Nikolai Besanov and Valeria Yanisheva launched a unique cultural project called Svenko, meaning festival. They're trying to recreate everyday Romani life from far away and long ago. Nikolai and Valeria attempt to reconstruct every tiny detail. There was a picture of an English Romani woman wearing a slightly torn apron. And Nikolai copied all the details from the picture. Therefore, it is very authentic. But the two believe their most important goal is to gather a record of the details of today's Romani culture. According to historians, Romani folklore tends to fade two generations after moving to a new campsite. They adopt local music and singing traditions, and their clothes also change. Valeria is a professional singer and dancer. She sews traditional costumes herself, selects the accessories, and even uses oil paint as makeup. Romani women used to spend all their time working in the open, and so their skin tone was one that can't be replicated with conventional cosmetics. One of the important details is bare feet. A 1956 Soviet decree on gypsy vagrants and labor was adopted by the Council of Ministers. This meant that the Romani needed to start wearing shoes when performing and dancing at the theater. But those living in the encampments still walked around in bare feet. Now the historians are filming Svetlana performing a Romani dance. She's married to a Romani man and has lived in a camp for 10 years now. Romani culture is fading away and we have to document all the music, the clothes and the dance moves while we still have the time. 200 years from now, people will be grateful that we did. We cannot forget the Romani world. And this is how the Russian Romani used to dance back in the good old days. The traditional dance of Russian Romani 
She does not hold on to her skirt, that's a stereotype that appeared later, borrowed from TV. A typical dance looked like that, it's just her legs that move. In the past, dance competitions were held. The one who danced the longest and did not repeat themselves was the winner. A Romani woman could make 40 different movements in a row. Now, very few can do that. It's the same with folk songs. They are gradually being forgotten, and the repertoire now contains only songs from TV. The ethnic culture is disappearing, and we can feel it in our bones. Nikolai and Valeria are ready for a new venture. They want to travel from one Kaldarash Romani camp to another. Yasha and Cassandra are very rarely seen together, Today's an exception. They've been sent to the city market. Alexandrov is one of the so-called Golden Ring cities of Russia. It's 130 kilometers from Moscow, boasting a Kremlin of its own and a rich history. In the 16th century, under Tsar Ivan the Terrible, a marriage market took place here. Thousands of beautiful girls flocked to Alexandrov so that the Tsar could handpick a wife from the crowd. The nearby villages were founded hundreds of years ago as well. This Romani camp settled down near one of them. Hello, Uncle Sasha. A narrow rural road separates these two dramatically different worlds. The Kaldarash Romani tend to keep to themselves. They live close to society, yet still remain separate. The only ones out of 18 Romani communities in Russia. Romani are just Romani. We don't care about them. They don't care about us. Our children don't make friends with them. And to be honest, we don't have many children here, mostly old people. Why would I be friends with them? My parents even tell me not to. Let's go for a ride. Let's go. Is the scooter yours? No. Whose? I borrowed it. So let's go for a ride. Let's go. All right. The boys once tried playing football together, but it didn't go very well. We don't play against the Romani boys much. There's no fun in playing them because every time they play dirty and they always kick us in the shins. We do not allow them to get too close to Russians. They may tempt them into going to nightclubs, for example. And we definitely do not want that. We do not allow any of that sort of thing. Nikolai Basanov and Valeria Yanasheva will come here to the village of Tatyanina, where there'll be plenty of work waiting for them, because here they'll find a slice of traditional Romani culture still intact. The Kaldarash are Romani who arrived in Russia from Romania in the 1870s. These are people who strictly observe the traditions that others have long since forgotten. The Kaldarash boast a very interesting musical culture. They use one melody for a very long song, which they can sing for two hours on end. Today, only a few old people can still sing them. Another song? Another song? This is the only song I know. Just one more song, because no one remembers anything anymore. Thank God I found someone. Musicians come to the encampment, together with Valeria and Nikolai, to help liven things up and inspire the residents. The two historians hope they'll finally see a real Kaldarish dance. But they're out of luck. Go! 
A Calderash dancer would hunch a little bit, staring at the floor. A Calderash woman ought to show that she is a submissive wife. This old-fashioned manner has almost been forgotten now. The Calderash are now adopting Russian Romani folklore. Many now dance like Russian Romani do on TV. Thank you all. God bless you. Do you not think the Romani themselves see that things are changing? The older generation of women had traditional braids. Younger women have more modern hairstyles. Skirts have changed. They used to be multicolored. Well, now they are plain. Headscarves used to be twisted like this. Well, now they wear regular scarves. But there is one tradition that seems unshakable marrying off children at an early age. Boys marry as early as 10 years old. And a future husband plays no part in choosing his wife. It's his parents who pick one out for him and pay for the bride with gold coins that were used back in the 18th and 19th centuries. These coins can still be bought today. Previously, the groom was supposed to bring enough dresses to last the bride for 10 years. Now it's more common simply to present her with bolts of cloth. After all, even gypsy dresses go out of fashion. Teresa is preparing for her son's wedding. She's already bought a lot of fabric, but has yet to find a bride. I don't know yet which bride I'm going to choose. Are you still undecided? There is a beautiful girl at a neighboring encampment. She's tall, fair, and beautiful. Well, good. It's good if she looks Russian. Is your wife beautiful? <laughs> yes. That's important too. She will most likely make a good housewife. Another important factor is that she comes from a good family. Isn't that right? They often have to travel great distances to find a bride. And what if somebody else marries this girl? It is better to marry her now before someone else chooses her. They are not going to live together as husband and wife now, as they are too young. They will be living together as brother and sister. The girl will get used to her in-laws, and it will be very unlikely that they will have any family conflicts. This is overwhelmingly due to the fact that spouses get to know each other from a very young age. And the young man, once he is married, becomes more responsible. When he reaches 18, he will be a man with his feet firmly on the ground. I also wanted to ask you, do you go to school together with Russian kids? Yes, we play football together as well. But for some reason, they don't want to play with us anymore. One of their players said his leg hurts, the other has a headache. The Calderash have been playing football for ages since they were nomads. Then they used to come to villages and play football with Russians. Russian Romani don't play football, unlike the Calderash, who are very keen on it. The Russians are afraid to play with us. Really? Is your team that good? No, but we will break their legs. The arrival of the researchers has become the talk of the camp and set off an unexpected series of events. The boys have been set free to play in a friendly local match, but with caution. Their parents are worried that the Romani kids might play dirty and get beaten up for it. It was hard to persuade enough children to get up early to play in the game. Are you really going to play like this? Come on, warm up. Let's go. They've decided to strengthen the Romani team by including players from the football club. Their opponents are wearing green shirts. Once the game begins, it's clear that the Romani team hasn't a hope of winning. Well, where are the defenders? Who's the defender on the left? Is it you? 
Well, why did you go over there? Defenders are not supposed to attack. You must stay over here. Stay here. Chill out. And stop swearing. And don't swear. Why don't you catch the ball? I can be goalkeeper. I can be goalkeeper. Guys, the goalkeeper's doing fine. Leave him be. 9-0. Nine 9-3. Nine oh. It's been a tie because of the penalty kick. Each of you should be playing in your specific areas. Right back stay on the right, but you're running left. I'm a right back. Correct. And you ran to the left. If you want to learn, we have paid lessons that are a thousand rubles a month. After getting a real taste of football, the boys share their memories back at the Romani camp. Yasha even tells his wife that he's going to talk to his father about playing football at the club, but he needs money for it. Well, I don't think his father will let him do that. Yasha can't find the right moment to talk to his father. Everyone in the camp is busy preparing for a housewarming party. One family is celebrating their son starting his new life in a new home. No one in the camp knows exactly when the celebration is going to take place, until the very last moment. It doesn't matter if it's just a housewarming party or a wedding. The timing is often not announced until the day itself. Only then are the people from neighboring camps invited to join the festivities. In the old times, the Calderesh went to the market to tell fortunes. But the Romani from this camp don't do that anymore. They've forgotten how. Despite her name, Cassandra has no plans to become a clairvoyant. She doesn't see the point. Nowadays, the Romani head to the market just to buy groceries. Interestingly, the men help out with this task, which is usually considered a woman's job. However, during a celebration, everyone in the camp must know their place. Women do not sit at the same table as men. They dance with energy and gusto. Maria misses the old traditions. The arrival of the Romani historians has inspired her. She really feels like dancing to an accordion and drinking tea from a samovar. So she decides to gather the young people together and celebrate the holiday according to the old traditions. But the sad truth is that the samovar has already been sold and they've had to call in a Russian musician because no one remembers how to play the accordion. The celebration wasn't a huge success. The boys started playing football while the girls ran off to pick berries. Yasha still hasn't mustered up the courage to talk to his father about becoming a professional footballer. That's just still a distant dream. Tomorrow, he'll go to the construction site with his father to paint fences to earn money for something much more realistic, like a car. <laughs> Valeria and Nikolai will continue hunting for precious examples of fading Romani culture. <laughs>